See, this is what happens when we bring a rookie co-host on. She doesn't understand that she's supposed to be the one that goes, Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of that unnamed security show starring Jenny Duong and Tyler Shields, CMO of Jupiter One. Like, that's your job. What happened? Yeah, it's not. I'm a stand-in, and I can never, ever replace <laughs> Ashley Lee on this show. I'm just here begrudgingly and doing her a favor. But you, you, need, you do need to work a little bit on your radio voice. Oh, I will try. <laughs> you you got to have, thank you for joining us today. Like, you got to have that low radio oh, okay. voice. Not, not working oh, for sorry. you. Sorry, okay. I'll, no, no, no. I mean, I think I could try to bring out my Elizabeth Holmes, you know, out with like a little deeper octave, but uh, I'm not very good who the, at it. Who the hell is no. Elizabeth Holmes? You don't know? No. Come on. Okay. No, no, no. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about this later because I can't be the only one trolling you. Um, I think I'll leave that to our guest to bring this up. <laughs> All right. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining the latest episode of the Unnamed Security Show, which um, I believe we've actually centered upon a new name, which we will be unveiling after the first of the year, after the first of January. I'm not going to... Uh, not going to release it at the moment, but we do have a really cool name, which, believe it or not, I think um, has come from our CEO at Jupiter One, Erkong Zhang, came up with it. Um, <laughs> so our guest is already trolling me. I'm sorry, I just got distracted. Our guest is trolling me about not knowing who Elizabeth Holmes is. I don't know who that is. I'm going to have to Google it during like a moment of calm here. But um, we will be coming out with a new show name uh, after January. We're also working on a whole bunch of new amazing graphics and overlays and fun games. Uh, we have a couple new games that um, my illustrious co-host Jenny today decided she wasn't quite prepared to play with me yet. So we'll, we'll work on getting those to the forefront. But first of all, I'd like to introduce you to Jenny Duong, who is, uh, she's been with me for over a decade. No, not quite, has it? Six years, seven years oh, yes. we've been working together? No, it's been eight or nine years we've worked together. Um, yeah, eight or nine very long years together. Uh, I guess the best way to, to kind of sum up our relationship is the work wife and work husband who have divorced and somehow gotten <laughs> together again multiple times. Um, but yeah, no, Tyler and I have worked together over the last eight or nine years in various roles, various companies from uh, Forster Research, right? Back in early, what, 2012 uh, to Signal oh, Sciences. Was, oh my God, I forgot that was 2012. That was a long time ago. Yeah. Oof. It's a long yeah, it was, time ago. It, it is almost, it'll be 10 years next year. So yeah, we, um, we go, we go way back. And quite frankly, I've been trying to get rid of her for a while now. She just keeps coming back like a bad penny. You're welcome. So, um, pennies are awesome. Yeah, pen, no, they're not. Well, there's nothing awesome about yes, a penny whatsoever. There literally is they're nothing awesome around. about a penny. They shouldn't they're be They're still around. in circulation. So they're still around. All right, Jenny. Um, why, 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 why do you keep coming back? Like, why can't I get I, rid of you? Yeah. Well, I think I've summed it with, summed it to, uh, I'm a masochist, actually. <laughs> so I just, I enjoy doing this to myself. Uh, but no, the real reason is because it's fun, honestly speaking. We've gone through a couple of startups together now, and every time it's just like this crazy ride, and we're always jumping on the most interesting or emerging like new tech. So I feel like- uh, Kind of like, like, like this one? Kind of like this tech that we're doing one. right now? <laughs> exactly, yeah. Even a millennial boomer like myself can enjoy this experience. <laughs> yeah, even even with an old old guy like me at, at the helm, I got you. So uh, for the audience that doesn't know, Jenny lives uh, overseas uh, in Asia part-time and in the US part-time. Um, most recently living in New Mexico and before that, Singapore, right? You were in Singapore before that? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, currently yeah. in Taiwan? Yeah, I'm currently in Taipei, Taiwan. So it is 6 a.m. my time as this is streaming live. Yeah, I'm dedicated. <laughs> she is dedicated, folks. She, she is uh, by far the best person I've ever worked with. I've enjoyed having her by my side for 10 years and 100% uh, would never want to do a show uh, without her being involved in some way. So I'm glad she had the opportunity to come on. Um, I'm looking at the show notes that you prepped, Jenny, going into today. Mm -hmm. There were a handful of questions for me. I don't like the show being about me. I don't want the show to be about me. It's about our guests and our uh, relationships that our guests have. Um, but I will 
give you the courtesy of asking one or two quick questions that you had written down because I don't want to just punt your entire prep work to the curb and ignore it. So <laughs> did you have any questions yeah. you wanted to ask of me? Um, you know, I think we can keep it light, but I guess, uh, you know, since I've known you for almost a decade now, like what do you wish you had known 10 years ago before starting this lifelong journey on, you know, the cybersecurity track? Cause you went from a security, like technical security guy to, well, now I guess a CMO. Uh, that sounds so sad of a progression, the way you put it. You went from being like a technical, smart security guy to, well, a CMO. I didn't. I did not mean it that way, honestly, but if you take it that way, that sounds like honestly, a new the, thing, not a me thing. The one thing I wish I would have known 10 years ago is how much a thorn in my side you would be for 10 years because I would have gone down a total different track. Thank you. Uh-huh. I'm glad that I would have been so, you know, fundamentally, you know, impactful <laughs> to your life. I, I was having a conversation with someone yesterday and they were asking me about my career and my history and stuff. And I said, look, I never meant to be in marketing. I never meant to be a CMO. And she's like, you know what you should do is start a Twitter feed called the accidental CMO. And I'm like, I kind of dig that because it, it really does kind of sum up my career. I've always just followed my passion. And that's the one thing I've learned is follow your passion. You'll be happy no matter what you're doing. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I'm doing this TV show. One, I think it's really good for Jupiter One, who is sponsoring this TV show. Um, but two, I think it's a lot of fun. Like I'm passionate about it and I'm enjoying doing it. So definitely the the tip that I would give everybody is um, follow your passion. Now, I'm going to do a quick role reversal that you didn't see coming and ask you one okay. of the questions you had queued up for me. Okay. Uh, aha, if you could have dinner with any one person, I'm going to cut it to one person, you only one, dead or alive, who would it be and why? Ooh, that's really tough. And it can um, only be one. You wrote down three, which is too much of a cop out. So I'm giving you the harder question, one and one only. That, yeah, dead or alive. Uh, shoot, that's really, really interesting. Okay, no, that's, that's not a hard thing. Um, Right now, Matrix is top of mind for me, as well as John Wick. So I'm going to say Keanu Reeves. Get out of here. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Yes. He might be one of the worst actors in Hollywood. (laughs) No, he's not. Okay. I just rewatched all three of the Matrixes. Stop. Bring the guest in, and he's going to be the deciding factor. Bring the guest in out of the green. All right. All right, I will bring him on now. Ready? I hope he's been listening because he's going to be surprised if he hasn't. Everyone, I'd like you to meet Adrian Snabria, the guest of our show, uh, my fellow co-host on Enterprise Security Weekly, an all-around awesome dude. Like, I've known Adrian a while. But before we get into all your background, which I'm going to dive into, Adrian, you got to settle this. Is Keanu Reeves a good actor? Yeah, absolutely. I I think objectively, absolutely, you can say he's a good actor. You know, it's... And, and and what your problem is here is that you're you're judging him based off of the kind of actor he is. And there are kinds of actors who can just transform and be chameleons and turn into anybody. And then there are actors who are just like another version of themselves in everything that they do. You know, like like I'm trying to think of some other examples here. So so um, what you're saying is he's The Rock. Wet, the Rock is the wet. same actor in every movie, <laughs> right? So like it doesn't make the movie bad. It's 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 just, you know, what you're getting when you get the rock. Understood. And so what you're saying is Keanu Keanu Reeves is a wet noodle, boring, monotone person in real life as well as when he acts. Uh, it's your I mean, show. basically you're all you all you your own opinion. <laughs> all you all you get wow. out of Keanu is whoa. That's literally all you get. You have you haven't seen yes. you haven't seen any of the John Wicks? You're right. He has yeah. six other lines in all three John Wick movies. Now, here's the kick. I love those movies. And I love The Matrix. Mm-hmm. Like, really, some of the best movies I've th- ever made, in my opinion. I love The Matrix series. But he's a shitty actor. Well, could it, could it be the same movie with a different actor? No, probably not. Like, if we put Ben <laughs> Affleck into the matrix or john wick would it be the same i mean i don't want to you know i don't want a harsh ben affleck's game but come on would it be the same well yeah no could you picture like matt damon as neo oh yeah i would have hated that goodwill hunting and that Mm -mm. can't do it Mm -mm. 
<laughs> yeah, I could just picture him dressed like Neil. Or how you like them apples? Wow. Well, maybe. <laughs> what about what about Jason Momoa? <laughs> oh no! See, Jason Momoa is a great actor, and the reason he's a great actor is because he has this wonderful look that's almost identical to our guest Adrian. Let's let's bring up a, a photo of Adrian at home real quick. I have this sneak there. He is. Look at the heart and the love that Adrian gives. Oh wait, no, that's Aquaman. That's Aquaman. <laughs> We love you, Adrian. Yes, sir. We love you. So, okay. Now that all the like one tenth of the joking we're going to do on this show is you know is we're the beginning. same age. We're like within a month of the same age. So think, it's funny uh, you say that. Jason, Jason Momoa was born like a month before me or a month after. Me. How how old are you? What? The same age as Jason Momoa. I just said that. Oh my god. Yeah. Jason Perfection. Momoa. That's basically. I feel what like I made that perfectly clear. Oh, see, you're a baby. I thought you were older than that. I thought you were two to three years older than that. I thought you were the same age as me. I got four years on you. I'm an old man. I'm not going to disagree. Yeah, no one's going to argue with that. <laughs> and it shows. It shows itself right here, guys. Okay. Um, so, Adrian, I was trying to think as we were prepping for this show. How do you have any idea when you and I first met? Like, I can't come up with it for the life of me. I know it's yeah, forever ago. It, it probably would have been when we were both analysts at the same time and at a conference. Um, we, we probably we probably met on Twitter before that. Ooh, ooh, sound, sounds me, so romantic. <laughs> yeah. I can do a quick when, when Twitter was still, when Twitter was hot and heavy for those engagements and communication, yeah. No, that's not your handle. TXS is my Twitter handle. I have one of those rare three-letter Twitter handles. And it's actually yeah. a funny story how I got that Twitter handle. I bet it's worth money. How'd you get it? Um, I filed a, uh, this is back in 2012, 2013 timeframe. And somebody was squatting on it. And I filed a trademark copyright infringement thing with them with Twitter and they made me put in all this paperwork. And basically I said, because I have a persona of public speaking that those are my initials and it absolutely should be mine. And I should hold, it's a total garbage claim, but for whatever reason, Twitter jumped on it. was like, okay, here you go. And gave me that three letter, uh, that three letter. So I used to be like some stupid, like Tyler X shields or something super long and annoying. And yeah, they 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 actually gave it to me. I have like if you filed it now, I'm sure they'd kick your ass to the curb. But they gave it to me. They they bit it and gave me TXS, and I've had it ever since. And I've had like tons of people ask me like to sell it to them. And the only thing I don't like about that Twitter handle is when people say thanks. Like people who don't understand how to use Twitter will do at TXS, meaning thank you. Yeah. And so I get random thanks for shit all the time that I had nothing. <laughs> That's to do so with. funny. <laughs> yeah. That's got to elevate your profile, though. So, I mean, that, that's in your favor, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if my profile is worth elevating. But so Adrian and I knew each other. Adrian, um, in a former life, was an analyst at 451 Research. Um, and there has just been some amazing people to come out of that organization. Wendy Nather, Josh Corman, Scott Crawford. Um, Aquaman himself, right? There was a number of great people to have come out of that organization. I'm sure there's many, many, many I'm missing as yeah, well. Wendy Adrian. hired me in. Oh. Yep. Wendy tried to hire me in. So I bet you that's when I met you. She tried to hire me in yeah. as well. So um, a couple of years before that, our first tweet exchange was uh -oh. uh, March 11th, 2011. Oh my God. What did I say? Um, we, we were discussing... Um, blackberry and the security of mobile phones wow that's <laughs> jenny almost lost her drink <laughs> yeah oh yeah i yeah. forgot that you covered mobile sec oh man no, that, was, that was that was before i was an analyst oh. that was when i was doing r d at vericode um in the mobile security arena at vericode in yeah. 2011. so so i said even on mobile phones browser is the weak point and uh, you replied Yep. When RIM mentioned they were called RIM back then, they hadn't been oh, rebranded. Research in motion. Yeah. Yeah. They, they rebranded to the phones that they would soon discontinue because that <laughs> whole business failed. Um, 
so it was already failing before they renamed the company. But you said, uh, when Rim mentioned to me they were bringing in WebKit, this was over a year ago, my response was, welcome to being pwned. Wow. That was my first tweet to Strong Adrian Snowden. Words. Uh, I was Strong never words. short short of direct direct words, that's for sure. Yeah. That's that's wild. Um, gosh, that, that whole coverage of the mobile thing. You know, it's funny. I was talking to a... a um, a soon to be for a uh, forester analyst. She, she, this person recently got hired and I was speaking to her today and she was asking me for tips on being an analyst and stuff. And I was like, listen, all you got to do to be an analyst is make some bold calls. And she's like, well, you know, I'm afraid to make calls or whatever. And, you know, it makes me nervous. What if I'm wrong? I'm like, you just never bring those back up again. And you're an analyst. <laughs> <laughs> Fast forward 10 years, you forget about all the stuff you got wrong. And you just bring up all the ones you got right. Well, mobile security was one of them I got wrong. I thought that was going to be the biggest thing since sliced bread. Clearly, clearly I was wrong. But I'm not allowed to bring that up because it makes me look bad. They're trying to bring it back, though. Sentinel-1, we talked about that last week. We did. Yes, that yeah. whole move into mobile. Sentinel-1, there was another one, too, that we brought up last week. I don't remember the other company that had it, too. I don't remember. It was CrowdStrike or something, but... Well, I, I mentioned I was testing uh, Palo Alto's uh, Cortex XDR, and 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 they do have a, an That's Android right. agent. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so we were both analysts. Um, you went straight from analyst to where? Like, actually, let me let me go back Start. in time. Yeah. Before okay. I, I, I'm going to get to that. You and I also have similar backgrounds and histories in the sense that we came up in the BBS days. Right. Mm -hmm. Way back, 2400 baud modems, you know, 14 yep. fours, you know, dialing into local BBS calls, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what got you involved? Like, I, I always hear the story. Oh, I was for me, it was uh, hacking games and wanting to play video games. Literally, that's what got me hooked. How do I get more free video games? I got to learn to hack the phone system to get free long distance because, you know, you couldn't get there was no Internet back then. What what took you down the path to get you where you are today? Yeah, so me, I was I was going to school at uh, UT here in Knoxville, uh, University of Tennessee, and uh, in the dorm, my parents bought me a computer, and that was the first time I had a computer that was my own, could install whatever I wanted, do whatever I wanted uh, to with it, and I was just fascinated, and I, I wanted to learn everything about computers, you know, everything related to it, and um, you know, to the point where I'd skip classes, like like I'd just mm -hmm. be in the middle of you know, tearing it apart, putting it back together, you know, playing in, with... in installing Linux from 37 floppy disks. Yeah. Um, that was a little bit later. I don't, I don't think I was putting Linux on it just yet. Uh, maybe a year or two later, I started getting into Linux, uh, when I started working at CompUSA. Uh, uh so, so working uh, at CompUSA uh, was, a you know, that, that exposed me to more. And then from there I got a job at, um, uh, doing dial-up tech support, internet tech support. And boy, what a tough job that is. You know, and that thinking back awful. to, so this was uh, late 90s, uh, mid to late 90s. So broadband was just coming out like around the turn of the, the century from, you know, 99, 2000, was first started to see DSL modems coming out. And um, so most of our, almost all of our customers, uh, when I first got that job, were uh, dial-up. And anybody from any walk of life, you know, from any background, you could get on the phone and their modem's not working. And they're calling you on the line that their modem uses to connect to the internet. So anything, and first of all, you're blind, right? Like there's no way to remotely connect to their computer, to yeah. screen share, or anything like that. So you have to you know, like the communication you have to learn there, the skills that you have to have to say, you know, in your mind, you have to be able to imagine what they're doing, what screen they're on uh, and, and tell them how to navigate, you know, how to look for things. Um, like I, I had people on the phone where I had to change my language for them to, to follow along with, with what I was saying. Like uh, we get a lot of people from like uh, Eastern North Carolina, from Kentucky, this one guy, I had to tell him to mash his mouse. Like, like I couldn't tell him to click it. I, I, I had to tell him to mash it. And, what you um, mean click? What you mean click? Oh, mash? You want me to mash the mouse? And, and you're going to do your best to diagnose what's going on. And, you know, eventually you have to hang up with them and they just have to try it. 
and you have no idea if what you told them ever fixed the problem. And then basically no you hope like hell when they call back that they get the guy next to you and not you again. Well, I, I mean, the odds, you know, unless you're in a really, really tiny call center, the odds are pretty good. They're not going to get you. And the customer is just depending on you taking really good notes for the next person so that they don't end up taking them through the same steps that you just took them through uh, or, or make the situation even worse. And, so, and you just so, learn. Go ahead. Little things like I, I remember having a 20 minute conversation with a woman um, and, and eventually like she was explaining to me what was going on and there was just this long story behind it. And I was like, well, you know, if you could, you know, for me, if, if you could just click here, and she was like, oh, I'm not at home. <laughs> I, I'm at the bar. <laughs> I was like, okay. how did I get 20 minutes into this call wow. and not even ask where you were? Okay. So, um, I have, I want Jenny to judge this. Okay. That is a horrible job, but yes. my worst okay. job, my, so Jenny, you're going to judge worst job because I'm going to try to play the one up game with Adrian here. Okay. My worst job okay. is in the, okay. in the United States postal service. Okay. So I worked in the USPS uh, incident response sock. Okay. Which at the time that I worked there was me and two other people. So there were three of us for the entire United States Postal Service. Like <laughs> that was the sock. Um, and the interesting thing about that particular sock, if you think about it, you're like, well, it's the Postal Service. How, you know, really, how big is the Postal Service? The interesting thing about that is at the time, MCI WorldCom, this was in, nine, in 2001, basically was the Postal Service. Because you got to understand, you're connecting every little podunk nowhere a post office has to be connected back to the to the postal service systems right so literally the whole united states was the postal service network was mci worldcom they were all one in the same anyways inside the sock my boss came over one day and he taps me on the shoulder he's like tyler i need you and this is the worst job in history i need you to review all of the firewall and web intrusion detection logs all of the accesses everybody's doing from web Everything that gets automated and tagged as potentially malicious or pornographic, I want you to go onto that website and verify if it's bad. And if it is, you need to fill out this form. So I turned around because I, I, I don't know whether it's like career limiting is like part of in my job description where everywhere I work. I turned around and told the guys, no, I said, no, I'm not doing that. The poor guy next to me was now a CISO at a big name company. I had dinner with him last week. He had to spend, I forget how many weeks in a row, looking at web logs of every deviant, horrible postal, postal service on the planet, postal service worker on the planet. So who had the worst job? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, obviously, Tyler. That's, yeah, I'd, I'd give it to you. Not even close, that right? Yeah, I, 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 not I even take close. support over that, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I remember I mean, hearing a story, and I never knew if it was true that the postal service did catch somebody, you know, like like doing something with child porn, you know. Oh, constantly. Using, yeah, using that, that and, and and that, you know, and I don't know if this is true. I forget where I heard this story, but their response, like it was such an issue, they decided to stop monitoring it so they wouldn't have to deal with it anymore. So I can't verify the second half, but I can absolutely verify the first half that they've caught pornography, they've caught child pornography, they've caught um, without getting into too much, like taking extreme deviant dis descriptions, right? Like, I'm not even going to bring them up on this on this webcast. Extreme deviant stuff. Um, that's why I wouldn't do the job. That's why I told them you're gonna have to fire me before I do that. Like, I just, I'm not going to sit there and look at that stuff all day long, no. every day. And this poor guy had to do it. Now, I I don't remember if they stopped doing it. I believe they did shortly after that because the fallout of the quantity and what they were finding was so much. So I believe you're right. But it, this is a long time ago. This was over 20 years ago. So I hardly remember it. But um, Jenny, you have yes. a list of, of topics that you wanted to bring up with Adrian. Oh, before we get to your topics. So you came up, you were doing call center. I want to get to today. Okay. Yeah. So, so let me, let me fast track that. Um, so it doesn't take too long. Uh, we we, yeah, got, we so, got time. You're all right. So, so, so working at a um, doing dial up 
tech support, which was, and I graduated my next job, I was doing broadband tech support uh, mm -hmm. for um, uh, Singular, I get, no, no mm -hmm. it wasn't Singular, it was um, Bell South, Bell South okay. DSL, um, before all that became Verizon, I guess. Did you ever have to pop? Did you ever have to pop? Did you ever have to polish the fiber? Did you ever have to do that? Oh no, no. I'm I'm just sitting in the in the call center. You know, <clears> to show you how old I am, at one point in my career in the early '90s and '93, I had to polish fiber. I had to terminate fiber for a living. Horrible job. Anyways, continue. Yeah, <laughs> yeah back in the dial-up days, we used to have to jump into the the uh, portmaster. The uh, oh yeah. Livingston Portmaster and reset ports and stuff like that. I remember that very um, well. And we asked, used to have to do stuff with the D slams also, though I, mm -hmm. I, I don't remember any of the details. Um, yeah, closest I've ever been to just losing my sanity. I would do anything uh, to put my phone in some kind of aux state and, and not take that next call. Like, like mm -hmm. two minutes, three minutes, like like any time to just like sit and recover. Uh, it, it was it was awful. <laughs> It was awful, man. Wow. It was just soul destroying. But uh, yeah, so I, I ended up, you know, just jumping into the industry. I never finished college, never got a degree. And uh, and a good friend of mine uh, actually got me hired into the company he worked for, which ended up being one of the largest payment processors in the U.S. And I was on the IT side. You know, so I started out uh, as a system architect. And like day one, first thing I did is, you know, just went through, it was one of those places where people got uh, advancement internally, you know, not necessarily because they knew what they're doing, but because they had been there a long time. Ah. And uh, and they, they had this guy who just, there was a memory, memory leak on a bank of uh, BEA tuxedo application servers. And the way he fixed it is he just reboot them when the call center reported that their, their app stopped working. And that would fix it for four hours until all the RAM filled up again. <laughs> Oh and then he God. just rebooted again. Oh my and, God. and so that like that was my first job coming in. So it was very rewarding, like because I, I didn't know, you know, what an enter enterprise IT job was going to be like or if I was going to be able to do it. So it was really rewarding to kind of to, you know, by this point, um, I, I had built a lab at home. You know, I had mm -hmm. broadband. I actually uh, how I got into like getting some confidence in my skills is I. Uh, registered a domain name and I ran my own email and I ran my own website and I ran websites mm -hmm. for a couple of friends of mine. Cause I was like, you know, what, what's going to teach me better than depending on my ability to make things work, mm -hmm. uh, to be able to get my own email and to be able to communicate with other people. Yeah. So that we definitely overlap overlapped in a lot of that stuff for sure. Like I had, I had all those same experiences. Yeah. So for five or six years, uh, I, I <laughs> depended on myself on, on a, uh, uh, a desktop running in yeah. my living room, uh, you know, to get email and, and communicate with other people. And, um, and yeah, yeah. So I, I got to use those troubleshooting skills and, and figured out uh, what the problem was. At some point, somebody had disabled a service called the uh, IPC resource handler. Mm -hmm. And so b basically like garbage collection, but for BEA tuxedo servers, ah. like, Without the service, nothing was ever releasing any objects. Ever. Got it. There's your memory <laughs> leaks. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, you know, this process was responsible for releasing resources and it was disabled on all six of these application servers. Uh, so I just re enabled it, problem solved, went from 60% uptime to like 99, whatever. It yeah. Is. Yep. <laughs> and you found yourself promoted very quickly. Yeah. So, so I, I, I stayed on the, uh, no, I, I did not, you know, in fact, I, I found that I came in at like half the salary of everyone else. And, and one of my managers, who's a great mentor to me, um, she came up as a mainframer, as a single parent, um, you know, just an amazing story how she came into it back in the seventies. And, um, and, uh, she really kind of drilled into me, like, like making sure I was making what I was worth, you know, mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. how, how to, how to play those games, how to deal with uh, salary negotiations and all that stuff. So I get a crash course from her and we eventually got, got my salary um, uh, corrected. Uh, it was a salary adjustment was, was the, the term that HR used uh, for that. So it wasn't a raise, it was a salary mm -hmm. adjustment. And I stayed on the IT side for, for about four years there. And uh, then moved over into security, 
you know, and I, from the beginning, I was doing uh, uh, incident response, though, because they mm -hmm. didn't really have anybody to do incident response. There was only one person in security uh, for a payment processor that had over a million merchants. We were doing four and a half million credit card transactions a day. One person in security back in 2001. Oh my um, God! Geez. Yeah. So, Where, so were I, you? Were you still in? Were you still in Tennessee? Yeah. Yeah. This is in in Knoxville. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Elevon's, uh, you know, still a lot of their operations are based in Knoxville, though they were headquartered in in Atlanta. Yeah. Got it. Got it. And yeah, dealt with uh, Nimda and Code Red and, and <clears throat> Oh, I remember that. And, and, all that stuff came out, got to deal with all that. Uh, so I got to do a lot of security stuff before I was formally in security. I was doing uh, uh, handling incidents from, from day one. Um, so a lot of good experience. It was one of those places where, like, I was a curious guy. You know, again, I, I was still hard on this curiosity train, like, want, want to understand everything, do a bit of everything. And they let me. And I, I would work 80-hour weeks and just absorb everything they'd let me absorb. And uh, yeah, so so it was good experience. I was there when PCI first came out, you know. So I was well positioned to learn a lot of stuff uh, about the industry. And um, and it wasn't until you know eventually after seven almost eight years there, uh, I really wanted to. I, I was done. Like I, I felt like I couldn't really <laughs> get anything done there anymore, and just wanted to go consult and you know get to go in, look at somebody else's network you know, tell them what to do with it and leave, <laughs> you know, move on. To so the next so slide. what'd you do? Did you get a consulting gig or did you build your own thing? What'd you yeah. end up doing? No, no consulting gigs. So we, there was a, a fairly big uh, security firm here in Knoxville called Sword, uh, Sword and Shield back at the time. Uh, oh, they're, okay. they're not around and they transformed into, they combined with a couple other firms by PE shop, you know, bottom sure. up, tur turn them into basically a, a MSSP. Ah, and, okay. Uh, <clears throat> but yeah, back then, um, they, they were pretty big, uh, did international stuff, you know, a lot of stuff in the US. Yeah, they, they were fairly well known. They did some reselling also. Um, and, uh, and Dave Shackelford, if you know Dave, was mm -hmm. my boss for some of my time there. And uh, he okay. was the one who convinced me to get involved in the community, to go to conferences. Uh, and, and he's the one I learned from, you know, who's like, Look, bold takes or, or what you want to do, because I remember his blog like like he would he would he would if you remember back in the heyday of, of some of his blog posts would just set Twitter and, and the Internet on fire. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and so I learned that from him, like, 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 don't be shy about it. Like, you know, if, if you've got a good take, you know, share it, you know, and, and that's where the conversation happens. Like, like if you're saying what everybody else is saying. You know, that's right. No conversation happens. Like, like, why, why even read that if it's already that's been right. written? And then later on, when I got uh, hired by Wendy, you know, I, I learned to, you know, evolve on that, and, and she taught me to make sure my hot takes were defensible. You know, ah, not, yeah. Not, <laughs> not just shooting from the hip. You know, like, like. Mm. And she say, you know, that's fine, but you know, if you're going to be putting this stuff together, you know, that's going to bring heat back on me. You know, <laughs> but let's at least make sure, <laughs> like, like we can wow. we can defend this stuff. You know, like put me in a good position before you get me in trouble. In other words, but um, excellent advice. Also, uh, a, a great mentor to me. Uh, a long history of, um, you know, mo most of my mentors coming up uh, were women. You know, with the exception oh. of. of of Dave. <clears throat> that's awesome. That's fantastic. Yeah, I was going to say, that's fantastic, Adrian, because as an analyst, I don't think Tyler learned to make those big, you know, big call outs and takes and make them defensible. Because I will tell you, I was his, I think I was the research associate for Tyler during his time at Forrester as an industry analyst for a bit. And um, sometimes I just feel like, where is this coming from? And I yeah. swear he was just pulling it from the ether. <laughs> Yeah, what, yeah, what was he saying earlier? Great. Just what was his advice earlier? He just sweep it under the rug. You yeah, you just only only again. bring up the winners. You never bring up the losers, and nobody knows the difference. Nobody's none the wiser. But yeah, Jenny, except Jenny, for the people who went through it with you. 
Jenny did have to deal with a lot of my shooting from the hip back in the day, for sure. Um, so I don't know, Adrian, if you can see the comments uh, that are happening here, but Jeffrey Lee, who is actually a Jupiter One, uh, a friend of Jupiter One, Jupiter One employee, wants to know if you have any advice for people wanting to break into security. What would be your advice to people wanting to break into security? So, so originally, you know, I've been on a bit of a roller coaster. Uh, you know, I tell people get into IT first. You know, you really need to go that route because security is a second layer on top of technology. And if you don't understand the underlying technology, and, and I, I think there's a lot of value in understanding the jobs that those people do uh, on the IT side, uh, it, it's tough to do security and have the right perspective, to have the right context. Like, like it, it's tough to tell somebody they need to fix a vulnerability when you've never walked in their shoes and, and you know, you've never done that kind of work. So on a relationship building uh, um, from that kind of perspective, it really helps to have done that job before. And, uh, and you know, I kind of went away from that and said, you know, in the last, uh, you know, maybe around 2010, you know, I started to see some jobs where, yeah, maybe, maybe it can be entry level. Uh, but today I'm, I'm moving back towards, I've had a bunch of mentees that I've been trying to help break into security hmm. and there's just no junior roles, you know, that, that, that they can find. They, they haven't been able to get into it. And most of the roles want at least three to five years of experience in security. And they're coming to me saying, but where, where, where is that three to five? I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing the, you know the job you get to get that three to five. Mm. And I think that's what it is, is a lot of people are laterally moving over like I did after three to five years on, on the IT side. So that's, that's my advice again, is uh, get an IT gig first, doesn't matter what it is. Uh, you know, it could be developer, it could be system admin, could be cloud engineer. There's a lot of new jobs now uh, that, that are entry level jobs. Go that route first. That's a bit surprising to me, Adrian, where, um, you know, it's like they're expecting three to five years of experience or a couple of years experience when all I've heard over the past, you know, decade that I've worked in cybersecurity is there is a shortage of security people resources, right? But where are I, they? I mean, I, yeah. yeah, where are they then? That, they're, I'm they're not on this end. They're, they're strictly in the middle or the upper end. Like we need experts. We need more experts. We don't need more. Mm. And, and I think some of that, you know, like there should be some pressure on companies to build a pipeline, you know, and to, you know, maybe bring in interns, have, in, have internships, bring in junior folks. Uh, I've worked at a few places that had internships. And I think being a, a field that's not professionalized, it's super important, you know, to, you know, to be, to be able to train people up and, uh, and not just throw them into these jobs. Because a lot of it is experience. You got to find that experience somehow. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I love hiring junior people. Like I always have. Um, I've always just found it to be the most rewarding as a, as a leader is to grow people and to get them to be the best version of themselves and whatever that can be. Right. Like inside of marketing, there's so many different facets of marketing, just like security inside security. There's like a thousand different versions of what security can be to an individual contributor. Right. So helping them find the one, the, the one thing that becomes their passion and helping them embrace that and grow into that. I love it. I think more and more people should do it. Um, I think we should go on a campaign, a public campaign, you and I, Adrian, to, to get this problem fixed. Sign up, sign you up, let's go. And, and what are the entry level security jobs right now? You know, like, like they're low level SOC and like, like they're the jobs most likely to send people running and screaming away from this industry, <laughs> right? <laughs> this is true. This is true. That's not now, the best I, way to bring people in and to develop no. talent in a pipeline. No, no. And we could go down this track for an hour, but I do want to take a slight pivot. It's actually a 90 degree pivot and ask you, because this is podcasting, video podcasting, all of the stuff that I am doing here and I do with you on Enterprise Security Weekly is new to me. I've been doing it with you guys. I don't know. Uh, let's call it eight months, nine months, whatever it is I've been doing with you guys mm -hmm. a year. Um, and I freaking love it. I look forward to every week that we get together and hang out and talk. And I mean, enough so that I'm doing this show right on top of it. How yeah. did you find that line of work? Like, how did you end up like, do you just know Paul? Like for those and, and give a little background mm -hmm. on, on ESW, PSW and kind of that program as well. Um, Cause I think we should definitely give those guys a plug for the work that you're doing there too. Um, yeah. But how did you find it? And do you love it? Do you enjoy it? 
Yeah, there it is. Security Weekly. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I mentioned, yeah, Dave Shackelford was the one who convinced me to get involved with the community. And I, I remember back in 2010, I, I did these monthly, you know, kind of um, PCI meetups, I called them, but they were more like therapy sessions. You know, and it was Chatham House rules and people could get just come and, and just scream and, and uh, flip tables. And y y we had folks in there that were QSAs. I was a QSA at the time. Uh, Josh Corman would join, Chris Nickerson would join. You know, so, so we had people from all angles of PCI, people that hated PCI, people that were frustrated with it, you know, we're, we're having, having trouble figuring it out. And, uh, and that, that kind of got me into, um, you know, not, not just blogging, but, you know, reaching out and, and working more directly with people. And again, Dave's the one who got me going to conferences. So that's, that's where I first ran into the Security Weekly crew. We're at uh, Derby Cons, actually. I uh, ah, ran okay. into them at, at several Derby Cons. That's where, where I met uh, Jeff Mann and, and Paul Isidorian for the first time, just sitting outside in front of that Hyatt smoking cigars is, is how I met them. <laughs> that's too small, uh, too small a world for sure. So second half of the question, do you like this medium as opposed to, say, the written medium or the short form social medium like do you like the video the video kind of television show style i like them both um you know when i found that 451 job i thought i was on a CISO track i didn't know there were other paths ah. in security so that was i actually saw two people post that job i saw a recruiter and wendy both post it to twitter and, and by the way all my jobs uh, almost 100 percent of my jobs in the last decade have come from twitter from knowing people on, on oh my Twitter, gosh. just networking on Twitter. Um, and uh, I, it was a new career for me. You know, like I'd never worked with a copy desk. You know, I didn't, uh, you know, I, I, I had to write two pieces. I had to put together two work products, you know, to get hired, uh, which, you know, to this day, I, th I think is a genius way of hiring people, actually having them produce work products. It doesn't work for every role, but, um, and I, I think both, you know, I, I like the video medium uh, and, and there there's, uh, you know, for, I think security weekly, I, I still think the vast majority of people listen to us. You know, they, they don't watch us. I think less uh, consume the, the live or the, the pre-recorded uh, YouTube videos. Um, but it's uh, I, I think they both have their place. You know, there, there's definitely still a place for a, a concise, well-worded five minute read on something that's important. Uh, you know, it's, it's not everybody's got time for uh, an hour video or a 30 minute podcast, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so I, I, I think, and, and I like them all, you know, I, I appreciate all forms of that. You know, the one thing I don't like about video is w what I love about writing. It, you know, I can edit it, you know, I can make it really concise. When I'm on video, uh, I've got the, you knows and the ums and the ahs yeah. uh's and, you know, yeah, I feel you like know, I I'm, disagree. I, I feel I like disagree. I'm so inefficient this way. Like, like thinking on the fly, you know, is is I, I yeah, I can do it. I'm not terrible at it, I guess, because nobody's fired me from from hosting <laughs> that podcast. But um, <laughs> but but there is something really elegant about really taking your time, and, and, and it does irritate me when people don't take their time with the blog post, and you go mm -hmm. and you can tell it's just kind of. Yeah. stream of consciousness and there's a bunch of misspellings and stuff like that. Like, oh, like totally. Like, medium. like all of the work that I've had to edit of Jenny's is pretty much like that. Ooh. Yeah, Ooh. pretty much no thought whatsoever. <laughs> Man. No, I'm, I I think I'm in agreement with you, Adrian. I, I really do enjoy like the podcasts and the, you know, like the video streams. Those are really great. There's definitely a place for them. And I know that the trends are moving in that direction. But I mean, writing conveys so much more and it's so much more in depth and there's so much more context. I mean, um, like anything that I read, I feel just more, I guess, emotionally connected to it versus listening to something, if that makes any sense, um, because yeah. there's just so much more information to absorb. Especially no. um, something that's well referenced and has links and stuff like that in it. Like, like sometimes yeah. it's frustrating because what looks like a five minute read ends up being like a 60 minute deep dive down exactly. a rabbit hole a deep dive uh, mm -hmm. yeah but but again you learn so much from it 
or there's a potential to. Yeah. But you don't get to see my pretty face if you're reading the written word. That's that's what I'm saying. Uh, that's a good mm -hmm. point, Tyler. It's a really good yes. point. Uh, pretty. I don't know. I mean, Adrian at least <laughs> has got this. Okay. Yes. Yes, that he but, does. But Tyler, he does. I should have gotten one of you. <laughs> should have had a picture of you that was, you know, a meme of and, some sort. But and trust me, there are plenty of those Tyler style memes floating around and old photos of me back at like DEF CON six and seven that should never ever surface. <laughs> um, That's good to yeah. know, Tyler. I, I I think I'm the only Filing person that, that holds those images. I think I'm the only person that has those <laughs> images because I showed some to Ashley actually a few weeks back, and she was blown away <laughs> at how drastically different I looked. Anyways, um, we're gonna so rapidly want to run out of time because I could easily talk to you for two hours, know. Adrian. But uh, something I want to know, for my own knowledge, is in the podcast world, do you have any suggestions on how to cut through the noise? Um, Jenny came up with this question in our in our pre work. Um, and obviously we're trying to cut our own path here by doing a, a live show that's fun and interactive. And how do we, what's your recommendation as an old, old hat in the podcast world to, for us to make this thing successful? What's, what's the one or two tips you would throw at us? So and hold you know, on just a second there. That's only a, that's a partial, very, that's a butchery of my question. I said something along the lines of, even Quentin Tarantino is getting into podcasting, right? And there's Ooh, a lot of really? noise out there, right? Yeah, he's getting into it. I mean, covering media, obviously. But I know that there's a lot of cybersecurity podcasts out there. Like, how do you stand out in all this noise? Because there's so much of it. You know, there's a ton of content in the world, I guess, where there's a lot being added to, to podcasting and, and writing. So how do you stand out? Yeah, you know, I, I think you stand out by standing out. You know, if you look at all the cybersecurity podcasts, um, every, you know, 99% of them are going to spend most of their time talking about Log4j this week. Uh, what, what I would do and, and the blog post that I'm considering writing right now is talking about why Log4j is the lesson we failed to learn from Equifax. Oh, Ooh, that's juicy. We're, we're not going to so, talk about that here. I don't I don't want to steal that thunder. I think that's a thunder, a, a better ESW discussion. Um, but I think the, the point is made, right? Having a unique cut at something is yeah. really the way to stand out in the space. And um, obviously our take on a unique cut is fun and laughing and enjoying. Like there's not a whole lot of cybersecurity podcasts. I think Paul does a good job at that on some of the stuff that he's doing. But there's not a lot of them. Like everybody hits the news. Like we're yeah. going to get through this. We may not even hit log4j short of what you just brought up. Now it was in our show notes to ask you about, and we were going to talk about it, but <laughs> yeah, it, uh, wow. we're not, we're not going to go down that rat hole. Um, but yeah, I think the tip there is be truthful to who you are and it's going to come across. Right. So I, I had a rule for myself that I would never publish something about a hot topic on the day that it happened. Like mm -hmm. I would let, and if you, if you look at all those, you know, like, especially if it's an announcement or something like that, like everything, the, the, the media, it's all just a rehash of the press release. Like it's, it's the press release words just thrown into a blender and spat back out. And so, and, and a lot of people will read that stuff, but I found that like, if you actually look at the interest in that topic or a trend going on or something like that, you have that initial spike where everybody's like, okay, a thing happened. And then there's a secondary spike where I noticed people would take their time, think on it for a day, sleep on it, you know, go have shower thoughts or, you know, however, <laughs> like you, you kind of get that broader context uh, for, for what the, the thing is. And uh, yeah, literally came to me in the shower today. I was thinking, you know what? You know, that this log4j is pretty much exactly like the strut situation with Equifax. And most people don't know that Equifax didn't get breached because they failed to patch struts. They absolutely would have patched it if they could find it. That was their issue. They failed to find it. They were never able. They dropped everything when that struts vulnerability came out. Uh, had the big meetings, sent the emails to everybody. Everybody knew struts was a huge issue within 24 hours of that struts vulnerability coming out. And they failed to find it in their own environment. 
So it wasn't that they didn't care. It wasn't that they neglected to patch or were slow or any right. of those things. It was that they didn't know how to find a tiny Java library in a giant environment. Well, it sounds like you are putting a phenomenal plug in for Jupyter One and what we're really good at, and it that is, is vis visibility. So actually, do me a favor, slide six inches to your right and point at your Twitter feed so that the world can see who you are. So it's right there, guys, at Sawaba, okay? So twitter.com at Sawaba. I, I bring that up and I want to point at it because Adrian had uh, had a post that, that kind of blew my mind with regards to Log4j. Um, I've seen, I've been around for 25, 30 years, whatever in this industry. So I've seen all sorts of classes of attacks. And I saw the Log4j stuff. I'm like, all right, great. It's going to be a web server pop, you know, pop the web servers that are logging, et cetera, et cetera. Great, no problem. But then he posted something that I thought was really cool. And we got to keep this brief because we definitely want to save time for our game with you, Adrian. Um, talk about some of the things that you found were vulnerable or, you know, through your reading, you didn't like hand right, research. Yeah. I don't think all of them, but some of the things that you found that were vulnerable. Yeah, so, so the thing that really made this different from struts, like we were talking about struts, is, yeah, you can attack it directly. You know, and most people are attacking it over web servers uh, using, you know, headers, uh, HTTP headers and things like that. Um, but Log4j just writes to log files. So any application that might write a thing to a log file is, is potentially vulnerable. So you think about all the types of things that result in something getting written to a log, and it just opens a, a, a world of much possibility everything. for, for it's everything. It. So someone changed the name of their iPhone to the exploit string, and it and it worked. And iCloud was a, apparently vulnerable. Uh, Teslas were vulnerable. Uh, somebody sent a text message, and there's all kinds of big applications that will read text messages. Like when Walgreens tells me that my prescription is ready, that's a text message sent by a piece of software. If that piece of software is written in Java and using Log4j and logs the message that I send back to them, then they would have been vulnerable. You know, I and that's just an example. They're they're not <laughs> they're not necessarily uh, vulnerable to that, but there were cases where people managed to exploit it simply by sending somebody a, a text, sending a business a text, where a piece of automated software is reading that. So, you know, and and, and that's why I say. A year from now, two years from now, we're still going to be finding things vulnerable to this yep. because maybe somebody hasn't written the exploit string to an NFC tag yet and, and like scanned it with, with a bunch of things or written it to a QR code, you know, and gone through, uh, you know, grocery store and, and, and retail self-checkout lines. Um, you know, even the Amazon lockers, uh, you know, that, that I use uh, will scan in a, a barcode or something like that. So all these ways that things take in input, nobody's ever thought of writing to a log file as something vulnerable. So no, this is never. not something that people have really prepared for. Yeah, no, and, and Jenny in her research actually noted something here in our speaker notes that the Tenable CTO, Renaud Derison, I think is how you pronounce his last name, um, yeah. He actually noted this. He called it a Fukushima moment for cybersecurity, which I think is 100% accurate. And, and it didn't occur to me until I saw your tweet about it, about the things that could be affected and why. And I was like, oh, my God, yeah. literally everything. Televisions, um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if baby monitors, like you name it. Literally everything here is, is potentially Java is shoved into a lot of weird places. Like, it like is. Most, you know, um, Android, everything on Android is pretty much written in Java. Mm -hmm. um, most car infotainment systems are written in Java. Uh, Java, Java, you know, there's a reason like when Oracle advertises Java, you know, talks about how many billion devices run Java. Yeah, it, it's and it's mostly well, stuff we don't think of because it's things where you can't see it. It's IoT devices and things yeah. like that. Yeah, well, or, I mean, the, tag, giant the tagline, banking apps, the tagline was Java everywhere for a long time. Yeah, that was, was the tagline of Java. <laughs> so, all right, we're going to wrap on that note with regards to um Log4j, thank you for, for catching me up on the history of where you came from. I find that super cool. Um, I love the recommendations for podcasting for us. Like I'm going to continue to learn from you and Paul and all the, you know, the path that you guys have cut for years and years um, over there at Enterprise Security Weekly. So definitely a, a huge plug. Um, at a minimum, 
tune into Enterprise Security Weekly, realistically, Paul Security Weekly, Application Security Weekly, Business Security Weekly, all of the Security Weekly podcasts are on point. But the one that Adrian and I do together is Enterprise Security Weekly and is badass. The last thing I want to end with is a little game. Um, Jenny, hit it. Jenny? That, no, no, Jenny. Yeah, she just wanted to see that. There it is. There it is. Rapid fire. So we, we, <laughs> rapid fire. We like to end. We like to end our discussions with a little rapid fire Q and A. So these are questions and answers where you don't get to think; you just get to answer. First thing that pops out of your mouth. I'm. I have the right, or Jenny has the right, whoever is asking the question, to follow on for deep dive probing if we choose. But you don't get time to think; you just got to answer it. You ready? All oh. right. Okay. Did, first wait. Question. Did I? Did I hear Adrian sound check real quick? Say something. Yep, not getting you. We lost your sound. Oh, no. <laughs> Timing is How epic. convenient, like, Adrian. My yeah, so sorry, my, my Google Home was going off, and I was, I was trying to, trying to <laughs> mute, and I've got multiple places to mute here. So I was double oh. muted. So. No worries. I thought oh, we God. actually lost I, your audio. No. Yeah, I thought no, it was just, retribution for showing the Jason Momoa image. Oh, no, <laughs> never, never. Have you seen that clip of him throwing the axes? Shirtless? 100%, yes. Throwing axes? That, that was him? Yeah. I thought it was you. No. Was <laughs> All right, Jenny, you, you start us off. Why don't you give the first rapid fire question? All right. First rapid fire question. Adrian, would you rather be in a zombie apocalypse or a robot apocalypse? Robot apocalypse. Why? Uh, just because of my skill sets. I, I, I think I know what to do better. Like I, I don't have a, a medical background, so. I think my background would, would help me more. I, I, I think that's totally valid. And I love that you came up with that answer like that before you even knew the why and then had a great why for it. Um, would you rather communicate only in emojis or never be able to text at all ever again? Uh, only in emojis. That would be great. I would be so bad at that, though. Like I, I everything I would fun. send... Everything I would send puzzle. would just be everything I would send would just be poop emojis all the time because <laughs> if, if people people would show up to the wrong places at the wrong time they'd show up with weird things. I thought you told me to get a pineapple, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it would just be like pineapple poop emoji, pineapple poop emoji, and that's it. That's all you'd get from me. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Jenny. You got the next one. Gross. Thanks, Tyler, for that imagery. Appreciate it. My boss, ladies and gentlemen. Um, yes, all right, I am. Adrian, would you? Would you rather have everyone you know be able to read your thoughts or for everyone you know to have access to your internet history? Dun, dun, dun. Ooh, read my thoughts or access. Yeah, history. I can control that at least. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. There's some control over cool. that. Oh, no. Jeffrey's trying. Jeffrey tried to put the Tyler meme emoji into our chat. Um, we have an internal <laughs> Slack at Jupiter One, and there's Tyler meme emojis. Um, so there's actually Tyler emojis inside the Jupiter One Slack that are nice. a little bit embarrassing. So I'm glad it didn't show up here. I'm glad that didn't work. Um, okay, here let's let's do a positive one. Would you rather have universal respect or unlimited power? Universal respect. Oh, I'm so the opposite. Give me all the power in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah, no, it's it's not a thing that I need. I like that about you. I knew I knew that's why I liked you. That, that would be stressful. Having a lot of power would be really, really stressful. It's like when you're a kid, you want to be president. Like as soon as you're an adult, you're like, heck no, <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't need that. No, nope, I like, I'll sleeping. Pass. I like I'll sleeping pass. really well at night. All yeah. right, Jenny, your like pick, that. and then I'll do one more. I'll wrap up on the last one. Your pick, Jenny. What do you want? Uh, another question. All right. Um, this is kind of a weird one. Would you rather vomit on your hero or have your hero vomit on you? And who know. is that it's hero? Come up with great questions. And who is yes. that hero? And who is the hero that's going to vomit on me? <laughs> or, or that you're going to vomit on. We need to know that. Yeah, yeah. No, no, totally. I, I would rather be vomited on because that would be much less embarrassing for me. And embarrassment is is not a thing that I handle well. Um, and who would that be? <laughs> who, who, do, 
what hero do I want to vomit on me? That is wow. the question we're asking. You're right. You're right. It's a weird question. <laughs> it is a very um, weird, weird question. question. Ah, you know, it's it's uh, it's going to be your fault, but Jason Momoa is just on my brain. <laughs> we absolutely need to tag and, Jason and, and that Momoa works in this. because he seems like the kind of guy that like you'd like to go out drinking with, you know, and maybe have too much. <laughs> and and yeah, you know, I could see how yeah. somebody might get vomited on. Much, but yeah, much he'd love. forgive you. Much but forgive now, you. Now, I, now I need to know, like like. Between the two of us, who can hold their liquor the better? So uh, I'm actually not going to ask my my final question because I don't think I can top the vomit on a hero question. Um, but 100%, we're going to tag Jason Momoa in this post and see if we can get Jason Momoa to respond. Or or maybe we can go find him on Cameo, Jenny, and actually get Adrian oh a Cameo, God. Jason Momoa, Ooh. that that shows him going, I love you, Adrian. Isn't that? Oh, I, don't, yeah. I don't think he's at the cameo point in his career. He's at the peak of his career. Isn't cameo yeah. kind of like a yeah? Like they're all C and D tail list. end of failing career type. Of yeah, thing? you know who would be on cameo? I bet you if you look is um, the guy that played Neo. What's his name? Oh, oh ha ha ha! Oh, man, okay, okay. I took it all the way back to the oh. beginning of the conversation for today. You did. Um, there you go. He there does cameos for free. I've seen it. He is a wonderful human being, and uh, you, you've burned some karma making fun of him on this. On this, uh, I know. I, I, agree. I saw. I saw a movie recently where he played like someone's date, and I can't remember the name of the movie. But he is just wedding date. No, 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 no. Or something like that. Yeah, yeah I, I'll find it. But anyways, it doesn't matter. He is um, one of the most overrated and horrible actors on the internet. I stand by my statement. <laughs> And if it turns out I'm wrong and he actually wins a bunch of Oscars or something, I'll just never bring it up and nobody will remember I said it. So it's okay. It's kind of like being an analyst. <laughs> sweep um, it under the rug. Sweep it right under the rug. Sweep All right. With that, um, guy. Jenny, Tyler, is there sweep anything Sweep it else? under the rug, Shields. <laughs> is there anything else you want to, to ask Adrian before we wrap for the evening? No, no. I think that we're, we're good. I'm super grateful to meet Jason Momoa on here. I mean, Adrian, obviously. Yes, Adrian. <laughs> Adrian, thank you so much for your time, my man. Uh, we're going to slide you back to the green room. Please feel free to just go ahead and log off. And I really sincerely appreciate you uh, getting on here and supporting us on the show, man. And we hope to do some more fun stuff with you in the future. Thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. Thanks, buddy. We'll talk soon. Get him out of here. Get him out of here, Jenny. All get him right. out. Get, get Bye, him out Adrian. Of here. Have a good night. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's you and me, Jenny. I think we're ready to wrap up. All right, let's wrap up. Say good night. All right, nothing left. All right, bye, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning into the uh, latest episode of the Unnamed Security Show, where we talk about security and relationships with my temporary co host for the uh, evening, Jenny Duong from uh, Taipei, Taiwan. And yeah, thank you for joining us, and uh, we'll talk soon. <laughs>